this session is, uh, is going to address very important issue, topics and issues in, in revascularization. Let's, uh, let's say revascularization, not interventional revascularization. Uh, complex ex uh, ex scenarios in coronary revascularization. Uh, we're going to address two important things. First of all is uh, the duration of the APT. This morning, Francesco was presenting the ESC guidelines just released last summertime, talking about the duration of the APT after stenting or, or after acute coronary syndrome, whatever. And uh, the other important uh, aspect is the vascularization in two different settings. One is a stable angina, which is a hot topic, and uh, the other one is STEMI uh, with uh, multivessel disease. And for this uh, important session, we have uh, two really uh, ex exceptional speakers. Uh, the first is Dr. Castrati. Dr. Castrati is, uh, he comes from Munich, Germany. He's the chief of cardiology disease center in the Deutsche Herzzentrum in Munich. He's the director of the ISA research center. They have published uh, many trials in the last 20 years, 25 years, and they, I think, is one of the most important contributors to in the field of interventional cardiology in the world. The topic is uh, vascularization in stable uh, coronary artery disease, waiting for the ultimate trial. Please, Dr. Castro. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jose, for your nice uh, introduction, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tough topic, uh, talking about revascularization in stable uh, coronary artery disease. So I, would, um, I have this layout for my presentation exactly the same as uh, it served for the uh, guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology. So we look at, uh, at the value of revascularization for prognosis and at the value of revascularization for symptoms. What is about PCI and mortality? So the first challenge, or uh, the first challenge uh, for the value of PCI was, uh, the first serious challenge was the COURAGE trial which included more than 2,000, about 2,300 patients and randomized them between PCI and uh, medical treatment. You see the data here, mortality at uh, seven years, not all patients had this long follow-up. And um, you see that there is some reduction in mortality, it's uh, 13%, but it's not, it's far from being significant. The investigators did an extended follow-up in almost half of the patients, uh, of these patients, and you see that at 12 years, there is still a difference in favor of PCI. Survival is uh, numerically better, but uh, far from the significance. But the COURAGE is uh, the largest trial, but it's not the only trial, looking at the value of PCI versus medical treatment. There are uh, 17 trials with the same, on the same topic with more than 7,000 patients. At uh, 2008, we pulled together all this data and looked at the mortality, and you see that uh, PCI was able to reduce by 20% the risk of death in these patients as compared to medical treatment alone. So these data haven't convinced that many um, persons, although it seems that it is significant. But you have to consider also which is the risk, the baseline risk of the patients entered in these trials. If you look at this uh, analysis uh, published 2011, it seems that the benefit of revascularization is much higher if the uh, ischemia or the percentage of myocardial ischemia is larger. So you see here that it's coming down the risk for early revascularization, and the risk is increased by medical therapy if myocardiomet risk is, is higher in proportion. On the other side, we know even from the COURAGE uh, itself trial that in a subset of patients in which they did, they did um, um, spec to look at the myocardiomet risk at uh, ischemic myocardium, you see that for those patients in which uh, there was a reduction in myocardium, uh, ischemic myocardium, there was also a reduction in uh, uh, mortality. As you see here, survival curves are higher as for those in which the proportion of my, uh, ischemic myocardium was high. 
So what are the factors that may impact on the value and on the benefit of PCI in patients with stable coronary artery disease? It is a large network meta-analysis looking at all comparative trials, cabbage versus medical treatment, PCI versus medical treatment, stents versus stents, and you see here that the reduction in mortality is, is being present for only for new generation drug stents. I, I don't put a lot of value to network maintenance because uh, this is not a direct comparison, but it is a message or it is an indication that improving the technology, you may increase the benefit of PCI in these patients. Another technology that may help is FFR, and this is the FAME 2 trial, um, which included about 900 patients and uh, randomized those with a FFR value uh, under 0.80 to PCI plus optimal medical treatment versus only medical treatment. These are the results. The primary endpoint was uh, the combination of death, myocardial infarction, or urgent revascularization at one year. And you see that the highest rate was seen by medical treatment alone and the PCI was very low compared exactly to those who had um, values of FFR above 0.80. What was, in which parameter was the benefit created by PCI? You see here the components of the primary endpoint. Everywhere is some reduction, but not far from significance. Most of the benefits came from the reduction of urgent revascularization. Which patients uh, um, needed urgent revascularization? Here are all 90 patients with urgent revascularization at two years, and you see that half of them had objective acute coronary uh, syndromes with uh, ECG changes or enzyme elevation and half of them had only unstable angina clinically. But the benefit was seen in both of these groups. It was larger for those with uh, only unstable angina, but what was present and significant even in those with objective signs of acute coronary syndromes. Now, what's about PCI and angina? So, uh, as I said, the percent of ischemic myocardium in SPECT was very prognostic. And if you look at this subset of uh, patients in the CARIGE trial, there were about 300 patients with uh, serial SPECT imaging. You see that uh, PCI was able to reduce ischemic myocardium and med medical therapy was not able to reduce it. If you look at angina alone as a, s a symptom, I have shown here the data for 30 days, and in all these uh, uh, parameters, the uh, PCI was, uh, was better. Was, uh, so freedom from angina was better for PCI, improved physical endurance was better, improved quality of life was better for PCI. I have taken the 30 days re results because after that, many patients from the medical uh, treatment group, they uh, crossed over to the uh, revascularization group. So you cannot uh, make a real evaluation of these uh, patients after 30 days. Now, the same thing was done also for angina, all the trials together, and you see that the relief of angina was much better for PCI, so you get better chances of uh, being free of angina if you are in the PCI group as compared to the medical, only, medical treatment only group. Now, another interesting trial is the Orbita trial. You see here the design of the trial. Patients eligible for a trial were aged and uh, 18 to 85 years with angina or equivalent symptoms and at least one angiographically significant lesion in a single vessel. So it is the most appropriate model to see whether PCI relieves angina because it's single vessel disease, everything was treated, and so the results are very indicative whether PCI is able to relieve angina or not. 
It's a small trial, about 200 patients in total. They uh, were randomized between PCI and medical treatment. Irrespective of the value of FFR, 30% of the patients did have values above 0.8. And here is the primary endpoint, which is the exercise time. Look at this data here. At baseline, exercise time was higher for PCI than for placebo. But at the end, the increase in exercise time was numerically higher for PCI. But even here, the p-value was not significant. I would say that uh, in this trial, there are several problems. One the risk of regression to mean because the baseline value was higher in PCI and you know that those, um, the val lower values tend to, to increase more than the higher value at baseline. Limited number of patients, I said it, short follow-up period, six weeks, single vessel disease and reliability of exercise tests might be questionable. I'm um, showing here a case, a 50-year-old man who came with this exercise test. We are very afraid with this depression here, with this uh, increase in uh, S uh, segment elevation in AVR, and we thought it is a left main probably. At the end, we had this result in angio, nothing at all in both coronary arteries. Now, after PCI, it was a very good result. Mean FFR was improved to 0.9. That means they relieve the, uh, the narrowing of these patients. But at the end, they saw an increase in the frequency of angina as compared to medical treatment. You see here, it's not significant, but it's, uh, it's more. It was increased by 13 as compared to 9.6% in medical treatment alone. That means these results may question the origin of angina. Is angina due to coronary narrowing? The coronary narrowing was relieved, was eliminated by the trial because it was single vessel disease. And despite that, angina frequency increased. Social media is full of attacks against PCI you see here, the evidence for invading the coronary trees is uh, riding someone, is as strong as that for invading Iraq. <laughs> PCI not only doesn't save lives, it takes them along with draining our healthcare system of its valuable resources. At the end, the question, would it be a good idea getting away with PCI after all? We didn't follow these lessons. I'm showing here one of the multiple cases in which we ignored the Orbita lessons, a 30-year-old patient, severe angina during soccer game at the last time, no cardiovascular risk factors, neither family history of coronary artery disease. This was his LAD. You see the bifurcation here. It's a stenosis. It's not a great thing. We looked at the OCT. And you see here a lot of plaque distally. At the side of the bifurcation almost, there was a ruptured plaque, a di dissected plaque here. What we did, we did the usual. So we put a stent in the LED, a big stent, four millimeters, uh, postulated to 4.5. And we ended with a kissing balloon. And here is the results in this patient and the OCT results, the final OCT results, you see a very good apposition of the stent. So what uh, we need, we need to wait for another trial, for another better trial, ischemia trial, which is the largest in this uh, topic. They are taking all the patients with the relevant ischemia as determined by SPECT or MRI or uh, ultrasound or a very a highly positive exercise test. But even for this trial, there is a lot of skepsis triggered by the change in the primary endpoint. They changed now the primary endpoint was originally for death, cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. But they put also hospitalization for unstable angina or heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest. At the end, 
Many are thinking that it's disappointing to learn just days before closure of the intention to insert it to the primary endpoint events which are vulnerable to bias in an unblinded trial. So I think that the ultimate trial will probably never come. The best thing to do is to consider PCI and medical treatment complementary and try to improve on both of them. And we have the case with PCK9 inhibitors Kanakinumab, which is very difficult to spell it out, but probably if it uh, enters the practice, we will spell it better. New devices, new antiproliferative drug, new adjunct antithrombotic drugs. As the case for this, Revacep, this is a very, uh, it's a novative uh, antithrombotic drug. So far, you know that all the efforts have been focused on the on inhibiting aggregation. And this new drug is inhibiting the addition of the platelets. And this is the trials we are conducting now, which is a 332 patient trial, phase two trial. And we hope to have a result in uh, one year from now. For the time being, let's stick with the current indications for revascularization in stable coronary artery disease, which define the cases in which you should do this for prognosis, for improving the prognosis, or for improving symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention. We can make the questions after the three presentations, no in order. Okay, the talk is ready, or do you oh, prefer? Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. let's continue. And we have for the three. It's an honor to present the next speaker. Mr. Francesco Costa. Actually, he's working in Hospital Clinic of Barcelona, and he was the first author of Precise DFT published the last year. He's going to speak about how to individualize DFT duration after PCI in acute coronary syndrome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's very difficult to uh, take the word after Professor Castradi, that is a person that has shaped the history of interventional cardiology. So it's an honor for me being here, and uh, I have nothing to disclose. So at first, we know that patients with risk factors has uh, a higher risk of cardiovascular events down the road, and this is even more so in patients that already has an evidence of stable coronary artery disease. However, acute coronary syndrome or ischemic events at baseline are a totally different bull game. So these patients have a dramatic increase of ischemic events, of cardiovascular events over time. And dual antibiotic therapy is undisputedly the uh, cornerstone of the treatment uh, for acute coronary syndrome. As, as we can see in the last years, dual antibiotic therapy has evolved with the introduction of more potent or prolonged treatment duration. We assisted to a progressive reduction of ischemic events, which however was associated to a progressive and specular increase of bleeding in events. And we already know that bleeding is bad. Bleeding is impacting uh, prognosis, uh, increased health cost, uh, reduced quality of life, uh, and in general, uh, for this reason, should also be prevented. And a possible way to prevent uh, bleeding down the road may be uh, reduction of the duration of dual antibiotic therapy. So the duration of dual antibiotic therapy that is recommended for patients with ACS is 12 months. However, sometimes we, we have the sensation that this is uh, something that is written in the stone uh, that cannot be changed. However, the, the pivotal trial that had been introduced in the field of acute coronary syndrome did not use this duration of treatment. In fact, in CURE, the median duration of uh, treatment was nine months, 15 months in Triton, and nine months in Plato. So for this reason, there could be some space for changing in uh, some specific patient subset the duration of the APT. And as we can see, this has been a burning uh, point uh, of, uh, of exploration in uh, cardiovascular research. In this meta-analysis in which we pooled data from 10 randomized clinical trials and more than 30,000 patients, we compared the duration, the 
the impact on events of a shorter duration of the EPT as compared to the standard of treatment, and we have seen that this is asso associated, as expected, to a 42% reduction of major bleeding. So extending this to ACS patients may have some, uh, some sense in some cases. And this has been explored in, this, uh, in another individual patient meta-analysis from uh, Palmerini. And uh, we can see that in this population, uh, three months as compared to 12 months of treatment in ACS patient was associated to an increase in ischemic events. There was a two-fold increase of MI and stent thrombosis. So it appears that this might not be the way to go. Uh, on the other side, the use of six months as compared to 12 months was not associated to a definite increase of MI and stent thrombosis uh, to a reduction of bleeding. And this is the uh, rationale for several trials that have been uh, presented more recently, like the Smart Day trial, in which uh, at the end, the six month treatment as compared to 12 months in patients with ACS reached non, the pre-specified non-inferiority endpoint. So uh, this could be uh, uh, addressed as a positive trial, but on, on the other way, the uh, Non-inferiority margin was quite large, and uh, also the authors state that there is some kind, there is some uh, direction of concern, given the fact that some of the secondary endpoints were increased indeed in patients that were treated for a shorter duration. In fact, there was an increase of 2.5 fold of myocardial infarction in patients that were treated shorter, and this is some way consistent also in the reduced trial, which used three months as compared to 12 months of treatment. Again, non-inferiority met for the net adverse clinical events and point, but again, some concerning uh, increase of all-cause mortality and stent thrombosis, which were borderline, but still concerning. So it appears that there might be some price to pay for a shorter treatment duration in patients with ACS. However, uh, the, I think that this data only suggests one thing, that uh, one size does not fit all in these patients, and maybe there could be some sense in individualization of a treatment for the APT duration. So, what are the theoretical advantages? So if we, if we select up front, for example, in patients that we consider diet bleeding risk a shorter DAPT, we might prevent major bleeding. This is easy. Uh, if we select patients at increased ischemic risk and no eye bleeding risk, there could be an increased efficacy of the treatment with no impairment of safety, and there could be also a better allo allocation of scarce resources that is also important if we think of very long-term treatments. And also, if uh, we inform the patients uh, in, a, in a better way, uh, better explaining what is the baseline risk, may, me, we may also get uh, more buy-in from our patients and improve adherence. So this was basically our idea uh, when we generated the precise DAPT scores. So the, the baseline idea was to generate a score that would predict long-term out-of-hospital bleeding events in patients on treatment with the APT. We did that uh, getting data from eight randomized clinical trials, uh, uh, merging at uh, almost f uh, 15,000 patients, and uh, with multivariable modeling, we selected uh, finally five variables that are age, history of prior hemorrhage, white blood cells count at baseline, hemoglobin, and creatinine clearance. And this has been rounded and scaled to uh, a score that goes from zero to 100 that we call the precise DAPT score. The precise DAPT score showed um, a, a decent discrimination and good calibration in two external validation cohorts, one from a large randomized clinical trial and one from a real-world registry. And most importantly, our idea was to test this uh, tool in order to understand if a shorter or a longer treatment duration might be associated to some kind of change based on the predicted risk at baseline. And this was actually the case. In fact, as we can see from these curves with respect to bleeding, there is no excess of bleeding if we treat the patients considered not high bleeding risk with a longer treatment, whereas in the bottom right part of the figure, Patients that are deemed at high bleeding risk at baseline, if treated with a longer treatment, have a dramatic increase of bleeding events. We did the same exercise, evaluating the effect of longer treatment duration on both ischemia and bleeding. In this plot, everything that is projected on the upper part of the plot means a benefit, an absolute benefit from a longer treatment. Everything that is plotted in the lower part represents an absolute harm of a longer treatment. The precise DAPT strata are in the, in the x-axis, in the horizontal axis. So as we can see, 
With respect to bleeding, as, uh, as we said before, patients that are not at high bleeding risk, so very low, low or moderate, did not have a significant harm from a longer treatment. On the other way around, patients at high risk, as we can see in the right part of the plot, if treated for longer treatment, were associated to a dramatic increase of bleeding events. With respect to ischemic events that we present here with a blue line, Patients that were at very low, low or moderate risk gained a significant benefit with respect to ischemic events when treated for a longer treatment duration. On the other way around, again, patients at high, that were deemed at baseline at high bleeding risk did not get any benefit from a longer treatment. So when we translate this to the net effect of the treatment, it appears that in patients that are not at high bleeding risk at baseline, there might be a net benefit of treating this patient with a longer treatment, uh, reducing the, the risk of uh, one ischemic event every 65 patient treated. On the other way around, this might not be the case for patients at high bleeding risk. In fact, this patient, when treated for a longer treatment, may be associated with a higher uh, risk of bleeding and one is a, a major bleeding event every 38 patients treated. And this was also cons consistent in the subgroup of patients with ACS. In fact, we can see that among patients at very low risk, longer treatment was associated to a 3.68% reduction of ischemic events. The same for low bleeding risk, the same for moderate bleeding risk, but this was not the case for high bleeding risk in which we don't see any benefit from ischemia and an increase of bleeding events, 2.61%, which is totally consistent with the, with the main analysis. And uh, for this reason, and uh, uh, the, the guidelines now fully endorse the, uh, the possibility of using scores that may be uh, supportive uh, to the clinician decision making, also to uh, re reduce the duration of the APT in patients that are deemed at high bleeding risk. So in conclusion, the first line treatment for patients with ICS is 12 months. However, this DAPT duration is not written in the stone and the treatment should be evaluated on a patient by patient basis. In ACS patients at high bleeding risk, six months of DAPT should be considered instead of 12. And finally, clinical risk scores are easy to use and may be useful to inform clinician-driven decision-making for DAPT duration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. Great. Uh, and we move now from the quiet scenario, the stable angina, to the storming one of the steel abyssinia mi and multivessel disease, which is really a really a very complex uh, situation for the interventional cardiologist and the clinical cardiologist that is in charge of the patient in the uh, coronary care unit. And uh, Dr. Castrati is going to present the, yeah. the evidence on the data. Thank you. So I I will shorten a little bit in order to compensate for my first presentation. So I'm not uh, showing some trivial things why um, multivessel intervention should be done or should not be done in patients with STEMI. There are advantages, there are disadvantages, and this was the situation in the guidelines. 2012, it was written that PCI should be limited to the culprit vessel with the exception of hydrogenic shock and persistent ischemia after PCI of culprit lesion. We should uh, modify this uh, sentence in order to adapted to the um, actual guidelines. So this should be read. Routine revascularization of non-infarct uh, related artery lesions is not recommended in STEMI patients with multivessel disease during primary PCI. This was the recommendation in the guidelines of 2012. 2017, it was changed to 2A, it means Routine revascularization of non infarct related artery lesions should be considered in STEMI patients with multivessel disease before hospital discharge. So, this is the actual, the current uh, recommendation from the guidelines. Why was this uh, changed uh, in the guidelines? There was added evidence in this uh, topic, on this topic, and you see here the new trials coming out. After 2012, there are a lot of trials. If we put all together, there are 10 
randomized uh, clinical trials with more than 3,000 patients. And prior to 2012, there were 30% of this, and after 2012, 70%. That's why there was a good reason to change the guidelines due to the added evidence on this topic. And what is uh, the pooling uh, evidence of these trials? All together, they show numerically lower mortality, but it is not significant, all these uh, 10 trials with uh, more than 3,000 patients. If you look at the recurrent myocardial infarction, it's the same uh, picture, so you see numerical lower uh, myocard recurrent myocardial infarction rate by doing multivessel intervention or complete vascularization in these patients, but it's not significant. The most evident benefit is in need for revascularization, and you see a 60% reduction in the need for revascularization in patients who had complete revascularization um, on top of uh, the primary PCI of the culprit lesion. Now, there is an ongoing trial, and um, I have heard that the results will be shown at the TCT this year. 4,000 patients with STEMI and primary PCI. Two groups, complete revascularization in a staged manner versus culprit-only PCI. 4,000 patients, the data should... Uh, um, be much stronger than existing evidence now. Is FFR guided PCI of benefit uh, in these patients for guiding uh, to do or not an intervention in the non culprit vessel? Here is the list of uh, trials, and you see that only three trials have used FFR guided decision for doing PCI of non culprit lesion. Although there is uh, only 30%, they have they include 50% of the patients because these are the largest trials on this topic. And what is the result depending on, uh, on the guidance of the FFR? And you see here that the order ratios didn't change um, depending on the use or not of the FFR. Here are the order ratios for none having FFR guided non-culprit uh, lesion revascularization, and here are the, uh, the odd ratios for those trials having FFR done. Timing of complete revascularization. Is this, uh, is this an important parameter um, with respect to the need for revascularization because only the need for revascularization was significantly reduced in these patients having complete revascularization? And here is uh, the list of all trials. Just to summarize, immediate uh, complete revascularization was done in 20% of the trials, mixed, staged, or immediate in 40%, and staged revascularization in 40% of the trials. Was this important for the reduction of uh, need for revascularization? You see here on this axis is the proportion of patients having one stage or immediate, immediate, immediate um, um, complete revascularization, and you see that the odd ratios are not depending on the proportions of patients having, um, having immediate complete revascularization. Exactly about this subject, a trial, a large trial, multi-star trials, is being conducted now, and this is the design of the trial. It is looked at the need of doing it immediately or staged, and staged is uh, three to six weeks after the primary PCI. It's a multinational trial, international trial, focused on, on this subject in, in Italy, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany. Now, we should understand what is uh, this need of revascularization, what is uh, uh, telling us this reduction of the need of revascularization. And here I have taken the DANAMI-3 trial. This is um, staged, was at three days, and 63% of the patients in the group of complete revascularization got a staged procedure, versus only 4% in those assigned to the culprit-only lesion intervention. 
Now, primary endpoint was um, the combination of death, myocardial infarction, need for revascularization. All cause mortality was not different. Non fatal infarction was not different. The difference was only ischemia driven revascularization. 52 patients from the infarct related artery only group had revascularization versus 17 patients. So 17 versus 5 percent. If we take together this, we see that 21 percent of the patients in the infarct related artery only group had the need for revascularization on top of the primary PCI of the culprit lesion versus 68 percent of the other group. That means what we call reduction of the need for revascularization is achieved in the, at the cost of having a lot of revascularization in a staged procedure or immediate procedure. So at the end, the number of revascularizations is higher in the group of complete revascularization. The same thing if we look at the compare acute trial here. So you see that here it was used FFR and 55% get complete revascularization or non-culprit uh, lesion revascularization. You see the results here and at the end if we take together all what was done at the uh, primary procedure and after at the follow-up, we have this result, 61% of the patients in the complete revascularization had a revascularization on top of that of primary PCI, of the culprit lesion, versus 17% in those who had only culprit-only revascularization. That means that what we call reduction in the need of revascularization is really not the case. That's why we have done a meta-analysis looking at this, taking together all the interven old interventions that has not to do with the primary PCI of the culprit lesion, and you see that the risk in complete revascularization groups is much higher than in the culprit-only revascularization group. So this is also the case for the culprit shock, which was... Uh, the trial for shock patients, and for shock patients, the recommendation was even in 2012 to have complete revascularization, and you know the results now. There was an increased mortality in those assigned to the complete revascularization group. So, although recommended by current guidelines, the evidence is not strong for complete revascularization, and the jury is still out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Castrati, outstanding. And uh, I appreciate that you both were very um, adjusted to the time allocated for the presentation. My first comment is related with uh, stable angina, because maybe it's a more uh, debatable question. Uh, Orbit has uh, really been a study with a lot of noise, a lot of interpretations. Uh, it's disturbing for me to see that many times the interpretation was inspired by certain animosity against PCI by certain groups. Uh, Orbit has a lot of limitations. We have to be aware of this. Uh, for example, for me, it's very important that one-third of the lesions were negative by FFR, and despite this, they did the PCI. 24% of the patients were in class 0 or 1 of angina before PCI. This is not the practice. Uh, and we could all mention many other things, but I upset. Both techniques are the same, provide the same relief of symptoms, PCI and medical treatment. Let's offer the patient both techniques, tr treatments, because uh, medical treatment is not free of cost, it's not free of risks. It's costly, had side effects, interactions. In the orbita, they were taking three drugs. They had weekly visits to the doctors. They have direct telephonic contact with the, patient, with the doctors every week. It's unrealistic and non-sustainable medical follow-up for intensive medical therapy. And the other side, PCA was done like here, like in, other, like in real practice. Then be honest with the patients. And if you have a patient that is 62 years old, stable angina, 90% lesion in meet right coronary artery, explain to the patient both possibilities, PCI, stent, or medical treatment. And let's see what happens. I'm going to tell you, I don't know any clinical cardiologist that is going to, to discharge a patient with a severe lesion in the LAD with positive FFR 
with medical therapy today. I don't know any clinical cardiologist, in, at least in my hospital, that is going to do this. And this is Orbita. They are not going to follow Orbita. That's my view. Uh, even in my case there, this uh, patient was free of angina after doing that. So th this, um, what is not believable from uh, orbit is uh, the fact that treating the only lesion doesn't relieve angina. This is for me, it's, it's, um, it's not reasonable. It's, it's not uh, reasonable. Because, uh, as I said, it is the best experimental model to test whether PCI is relieving angina, because it's a single vessel. So, but I think that a lot of uh, this confusion comes also from the way we get the information, follow-up information from patients. We are very complex in getting it, with long, uh, long forms, etc. So, what I do in my practice is, I ask the patient, he has angina, after the PCI, I ask, how is about your pain is better is not it's a very simple answer to ask from the patient if you if you give him in the hand a big form form to fill so i don't believe in these forms actually because it's a very and you don't need a trial for that we have enough experience to see that really pci is relieving angina patients are getting better are going to on the mountains, and they don't have pain. I don't need a trial for that. It is questionable for mortality, for sure, this, for this you need trials. Yeah. But that PCI is relieving angina, it's a trivial thing. Yeah, and a definite proof is that when the patients come back for restenosis, they come back because they have symptoms again. But and they tell you, doctor. 10% of the patients. Yes, I mean, that, yeah. but it's a proof that yeah. you relieve symptoms yeah. because uh, the 4% of people yeah. returning tells you, doctor, I'm feeling the same than before the PCI was done. Yeah. It's because there are recurrent symptoms. This means that the 95% not returning is because they are not feeling the symptoms they had before PCI. But it's, it's painful That's that it. also the, the serious medical journals are very affected by the impact of the trials or of the results on the media. Yeah. Because a positive orbital trial would have no impact with 200 patients. No impact. With 200 patients, with a negative result for PCI, it had such a large impact. Some question about this topic? We are net from the audience. Dr. Costa, yes, I have a question for Dr. Costa. Congratulations on your presentation. Actually, we have a lot of patients over 75 years. Uh, this population have a wide range of functional status. There are some studies which show it, a utility of frail score or uh, other geriatric scores to predict the risk of living after acute coronary syndrome. Do you recommend the use of frail score to help in the decision to uh, prolong the duration of DFT in, in, in elderly people? Thank you. Well, this is a very good point. And, uh, well, uh, I believe that, in a way, the, the, that information is, uh, can be extrapolated, at least uh, in the model for, from uh, other variables. So, uh, as already said, the hemoglobin, maybe a lower hemoglobin and uh, higher leukocytes values, it can be associated with some kind of frailty of the patients. So, uh, there are some other uh, elements of frailty that are not included that would be extremely interesting to explore that, like for example, albumin. Uh, that would be another great uh, way to explore how these uh, in frailty patient uh, affect bleeding risk. But I think that at the end of the day, the most important thing is uh, to apply these uh, decision-making tools to treatment duration. Otherwise, if we give uh, to the clinician a number, so this patient have a 3% risk of bleeding in a year. He cannot use this information in any way. I mean, the, the important thing is give uh, a, an answer on what would be the impact, at least theoretically or even practically with data, on uh, treatment duration. So it, it should be actionable. Uh, the Tocastrat is for the last uh, presentation. Uh, it's very honest for an interventional cardiologist to be critical, and I absolutely agree. It's not really fair to include 
uh, need of revascularization <laughs> because all of them have revascularization in the complete. Always we have this discussion in the hospital. Uh, it should be focused in death and MI or other points. And I agree with you that things are not clear. Our strategy, and I have my colleagues over there, the, they are in the critical cardiac, critical cardiac unit. What we do when we see uh, non culprit lesions that are or look significant is to do a procedure before discharge four days later and to do with FFR or, or IFR, an interrogation of the lesions. But especially if these are meaningful lesions, I mean proximal LED, proximal right, big vessels, not the diagonal or the marginals. And I recognize we, we fix these lesions with, uh, guided by FFR. Uh, do you think this strategy is reasonable or we should be more conservative? We should wait for the symptoms in the patient after discharge? So we haven't changed the strategy after the guidelines because it's a problem with also with the insurance coverage in, in uh, Germany. This is the biggest problem with us because within 30 days, within four weeks, you, are, uh, uh, you have only one covered, one intervention. That means this is, uh, for us, it will be a very negative impact, uh, financial impact. Yeah. That's why we wait and uh, we have had this strategy, we still have this strategy. We send patients back if it is a very severe lesion with the flow limitation, yeah, etc. Okay. we do it, no question. No question. Yeah. But otherwise, we are not doing uh, routinely FFR in these patients, and we are getting back them at six weeks, which is also for us financially, it's not good to say it, but this is the this reality. Is there, is there yeah. reality. Yeah. Dr. Sionis. Um, we uh, currently have, have the same problem here in, in Spain, at least in Catalonia, that um, you will get reimbursement only from uh, the initial procedure. And, uh, but this is uh, some kind of a double-edged sword, at least in our case, because, uh, okay, you wait, we wait for a month, uh, but in some cases, when you get your statistics, you, your patient has uh, uh, re-hospitalized <laughs> for, uh, um, in, 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 uh, in, after uh, the um, 30 days. So that's, I mean, maybe you'll get a better reimbursement, but you will be penalized from a statistical point of view because the patient has been re-hospitalized. This should be a concern for the insurance companies to, to rethink their strategy because it's, it's really, it's, really, it's, it's very, um, financially, it's, it's uh, costing much more. I know that, but it's uh, not uh, the problem we can solve in this way. So that's, um, Francesco, I have another question. In clinical practice, there are uh, factors uh, clearly related with high risk of living or high risk of ischemic events, like active malignancy or vascular peripheric, peripheral disease. Why were these predictors not included in the DEPT scores? So again, there's a Another great point. And, uh, well, I, I can briefly ask to the two points. The first one was not significantly modeled. The second one, we just didn't have the variable. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult to have uh, uh, an information on malignancy in a randomized controlled trial because most of these patients are not even included in clinical trials. So uh, this, is, this is quite tough. So, I mean, I think that this information might be get better get from, from registries. On the other way, it would be uh, important to, to set the stage and say what is the definition of malignancy. So it's an active malignancy, a malignancy in, the, in, the, uh, in five years before, so that uh, that's, could be tricky. And uh, with respect to PVD, uh, it was not a predictor in our, in our model. This is, this is interesting because it's, uh, in a way, it is a predictor of both bleeding and ischemia. In the DAPT score, it was one of the variables that was a predictor both of ischemia and bleeding. And for this reason, it, it was just cut down from the score. So, yeah, th that is a good point. But in our, in our score, at least, was not a, a predictor. Maybe there could be some uh, other variables that uh, were more predictive of per uh, peripheral vascular disease. Again, as before, in patients that are more frail, that could be a dominance of these uh, laboratoristic values. Is there any question from the audience? I, I only have one, yes. Uh, 
is about the ischemia trial. Ischemia trial was supposed to be the last answer to the problem. It was planned for 8,000 patients, finally was uh, halted with 5,000. They were unable to recruit the 8,000 target. And they now, we know, they changed the, the point from the hard point, the thenomai, that was really happy, you know, because uh, finally we have a definite trial. They included revascularization, hospitalization. Finally, what's your prospect regarding the famous and National Institute of Health promoted trial ischemia? <laughs> Yeah, 100 million for, for this trial, yeah. 100 million dollars. I think, Jose, it's, it's very difficult to do this kind of trials. It's very, very difficult. Because you see how long does it take to include this, although there are, I don't know, 100 centers doing that. It's, uh, it's very difficult. But also our practice shows, if I get a patient from coming from CT with a very ca high calcium score or narrowing in uh, um, Angio CT, and they are looking for to have a, an appointment to come for coronary angiography. If you say to him, in two weeks, please, next week. So the, this patient, who is able to know that the patient is, has coronary artery disease and to assign him to the medical therapy alone? It is now very difficult. It is this, our strategy of PCI, right or not right, is so much radicated in our heads and also in the patient heads that it's very difficult to assign patients now to conservative, to medical treatment law. We are good because we were able to finish on time. Yes. Thank you very much.